still arriving in Wichita, Kansas to teach and seeing a huge bouquet with an unmarked card that says, you are loved, is one of the most heartening experiences of my life. Mm. Thank you. You're welcome. You feel extra loved when you don't know who it is because everyone is it a could possibility. Be anyone. <laughs> <laughs> it's exploitative culture. It's my body to give. Are threesome gifts a thing? Taking a bra off. I like your bed. Horizontal. 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 This is Horizontal with Lila. I'm Lila, and I'm Horizontal. And I'm Matthew Stillman, and I'm Horizontal too. <laughs> with Lila. Welcome into Horizontal with Lila, the podcast that makes private conversations public. We discuss the details of intimacy while the opposite of vertical, wearing robes. To paraphrase my listener, Ghost Heart, Horizontal is the podcast that takes you into my bed and lets your ears watch as I unzip intimate conversations. In this episode, I lie down with my dear friend of 11 years, Matthew Stillman. Matthew Stillman is a genius. Matt's friendship, ingenuity, sheer breadth of knowledge and depth of compassion, keen interest, curiosity, and the ability to forge connections between seemingly unrelated subjects illuminates for me exactly what I was trying to unearth in essence, but perhaps didn't have the cultural or historical vocabulary for. He's changed my life. He's made my world bigger many, many times over. In fact, I owe my life at the villa and, by extension, this podcast to his curiosity and insatiable desire to share. In 2012, Matt loaned me a series of books to read. Sometimes I think of this as my independent study slash book club of one in human sexuality. And he made himself available for all sorts of conversations surrounding those books. Each one vastly expanded my perceptions of what is true, and what is possible. First, he gave me Arousal, The Secret Logic of Sexual Fantasies, then Sex at Dawn, and then Esther Perel's Mating in Captivity. For years, Matthew enacted a beautiful social experiment slash performance art piece. He sat in Union Square with a table and two folding chairs and a jar with a sign on it that read, Creative Solutions to What You've Been Thinking About. Pay what you like, or take what you need. He used his astonishing breadth of knowledge and reserves of memory to offer people an expansion around their problems. My little book club of one was not the most out-of-the-box creative approach Matthew has ever offered me in my life. That one probably had something to do with what he calls sacred rage. But the thing is, I didn't know about those books before then. And who knows if and when I would have found my way to them if it wasn't for Matthew. They form the beginnings of how I started to live into my purpose. As a human who knows a little bit about a few things, I had never personally known anyone who knows so much about so many things. Perhaps you're seeking a creative approach to something you've been thinking about. If so, get yourself over to stillmansays.com, S-T-I-L-L-M-A-N-S-A-Y-S.com. The reason you should try a creative approach session with Matt, more than anything, more than the knowledge, more than the wisdom, is his cavernous capacity for empathy. It is from this landscape of empathy that he will draw on all the reading and all the studies and all the discourse that lives within him. But without that peace, that empathy peace, this wouldn't strike the chord that translates through you into action. The springing forward, the impetus, the desire to shift is the real gift of his work. 
And if you enjoy lying down with Matthew and I, become a patron of the Horizontal Arts. Patreon is a great advancement in the life of the artist. It's a website that crowdsources income. It can make it possible for me to continue creating independent, uncensored, ad-free, homemade radio. For $25 a month, you'll get a monthly recorded love poem, two tickets to a live recording, or the next horizontal storytelling, quarterly lullabies sung by me, an invitation to a secret Facebook group that I curate, and a post of what I call GPG, Genuine Public Gratitude. Or not, if you want to remain private slash anonymous. I love you too. There's loads of other perks on patreon.com slash horizontal with Lila. It's spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash horizontal with Lila. And if you want to lie down with us in person, the next Horizontal Storytelling Pajama Party will be held in Brooklyn on Sunday, April 29th. All the details when you sign up for my lovely mailing list at horizontalwithlila.com. Also, I've got some pretty saucy photos shot by Valerie Zimmer. In the first half of this episode with Matthew, we speak of village-mindedness, our elders, the Orphan Wisdom School, Matt's first great love, his wife, and proceeding as if you are needed. Come, dear one. Come lie down with us. I'm so glad to have brought you to Brooklyn and to have made this breakthrough that you will come to Williamsburg. You just won't come to Bushwick. From Harlem. <laughs> Unless you have a Tantra workshop to go to. Right. That's true. <laughs> that was a committed week of activity. And I wasn't there at all that week, and I basically didn't see you. Alas. Mm, Matthew, you grew up in New York. Born and bred. Where were you raised? I was born on Ninth Street between First and A. I didn't know that. And raised, I was, lived there until just about age three. And then my parents moved to the Upper West Side before it was nice in 1976. And I was basically raised on the Upper West Side and then went to college. That's the only time I didn't live in Manhattan. And came back, lived at home for a little while, moved to 108th Street off Columbus. And then I moved to Harlem, where I've lived for 17 years. And your parents, they're still together? They are. How long have they been married? In November, they will have been married for 45 years. Is that a particular anniversary with a particular kind of gift? I'm sure it does. I'm sure there's a stone of a particular kind. I mean, 50 is diamond, but I don't know what 45 is. I'm making this up. I mean, sapphire, opal. It, it's, <laughs> I'm sure all the, I mean, one is paper, two is silk. So right. they all have right. some sort of nomenclature. Do they do that? No. No. They're not like that? No. What are they like? My parents? Yeah, what are they like? Uh, Meaning-seeking souls, I think, would probably be the most appropriate uh, umbrella to put them under. Uh, they're full of idiosyncrasies, to be sure, but aren't all parents. Mm -hmm. My father's from Brooklyn, my mother's from Queens, so they have an aspect of New Yorkiness. Yeah, there's a lot to say about them. It's like a whole channel to uh, vanish down about. Well, I'm particularly curious about what they're like together, what their relationship was like when you were a child and growing up. My parents are loving and also bickery. Hmm. And I think they've been like that for as long as I've been around them. There's definitely been that angle to their relationship. They can be very spiritual together, they can be very bickery together, and they can be loving Though their loving is very like a very sort of like New Yorky loving, like it's it's not sort of like you know hands on huggy kissy like oh baby I love you you're the best. Um, it's loving, to be sure, but it's not only that. 
How does that loving express itself? My father is a bit of a misanthrope. <laughs> In the Jewish tradition, it's said that there are 36 hidden tzaddiks who are wise men who are critical to holding up the structure of the world. But because of their important spiritual position, they have to be sort of not bothered by the world. So they tend to be very mean, curmudgeonly, uh, fussy, annoying people to be around. And I've always accused my father of being a hidden sadist. <laughs> and my father raises his eyebrow and his finger and says, I'll never tell. So what happens? I just had, I feel like, a very child Lila moment. What happens when one of them dies? Is another one born or does that one have to be coming up and then they get this status at a certain point when one of them dies and it just kind of flies into them like a fairy tale? I don't know the deep orientation on how the passage of Sadikari happens. <laughs> Somehow it does since I've never been on that side of the uh, their version of you. Know, blowing white smoke up a chimney to pick a pope. I just don't know what that looks like. Is, it's just as the lore goes. Is this only in a certain flavor of Judaism? This is a, a very esoteric question that you're asking. Well. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I throw out my hands I, like, I, ah. I'm, I'm, sh I'm shrugging ah. my shoulders too. Um, <laughs> There are different sects of Judaism. Only the most mystical sects considers um, Sadiqim to be the ones who are holding up the inner structure of the universe. So your average person who's you know going to shul on a Saturday probably doesn't believe this, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's quote unquote not true. It just may not be in their purview of even what they're thinking about. Whether it's actually happening as a horse of a color, but it was really just a way of justifying the fact that my father was both wise and annoying. <laughs> yes. <laughs> was he also Can cantankerous? Mean? Well, he certainly ha has had mean streaks. My father is also can be incredibly loving, um, but he also can be incredibly wise and incredibly cantankerous <laughs> and difficult. Mm -hmm. Prone to bickering, prone to prone to raising his voice or pointing his finger at you. Do you imagine that your mother was like that before she entered into a long relationship with such a curmudgeonly person? Or did she come to the bickering because of such a cantankerous husband? My mother has been married a lot longer than she was ever single. So I'm not sure you could separate that out at this point. I wondered if you had maybe heard stories about her as a, as a young girl or teenager. Well, I don't think my mother's particularly inclined to bickering. My mother's very inclined to have conversations where there's lots of back and forth. So bickering can ha can be one aspect of that. But my mother's a very discourse. good con Yeah, my mother can be a, is a can be an amazing conversationalist. My mother can also be an amazing monologist. Um, <laughs> And that's in no way a disrespect to her because she can just like say fascinating, beautiful, interesting things, but just on one breath and you never really have a chance to go, which is totally fine. <laughs> but it's somehow like it's, it may not be the perfect personality for bickering, but like it's well suited to take, to turn into that too, because she has like the, the appropriate skills. So how did they express their love for you and your brother, right? You have a brother. I do have a younger brother. Who lives with you, but you don't have much contact with. That's correct, although I did see him this afternoon. Really? Well, all of us saw each other. We were uh, having a, a meeting about the, uh, the house which we own together in Harlem. I see. Not a social call. But no, a it was not a social call. Business. But there was bickering. <laughs> Held to a minimum, but there was some. Between whom and whom? Yes. <laughs> Right. Okay. Did you have a different relationship with your brother when you were growing up? From age, I was I'm a, just about three years older than my brother. And from the, the very youngest ages, we were friends. And because he was a baby, I think once my brother hit around four or five, we had a very challenged relationship. 
a lot of things were, I think were happening in our lives. Until the age of, when I turned 13 and my brother was 10, there definitely were years of a strained relationship between the two of us. Not only strained, but there definitely was strain in it. When I was 13, I went to summer camp, which was a transformative experience for me. And I came back with a completely different relationship with my brother. And I loved him and cherished him. And really, it was a, a new dawn. And it was like that until 2003 or four. When I was away at college, we didn't really have much of a relationship just because I was away. But it's not like there was a particular souring that happened. And then 2003 or four, the relationship changed pretty radically. And I'd say in the last couple of years, our relationship has started to turn to be more cordial. What was the magic in that summer camp experience? So I went to a camp called Row Camp and Conference Center in Rome, Massachusetts. You took me there. I did take you there. That was a good trip. It's a beautiful place. It was a good trip. Yeah. And Roe is a Unitarian, Universalist camp, but it's not in any way doctrinaire about that. And the camp is really geared towards allowing kids to have a stake in their communities and be deeply valued for who they are and whatever they need to be. And so a camp like that, at a time like that in your life where you're so deeply unsure of who you are and whether being you know, fat or thin or popular or liked were always sort of on your mind at school, mm -hmm. all of those were just completely disassembled when you were at Roe and that whoever you were or needed to be was celebrated and lauded and deeply explored in conversation and games and so there was while there was technically swimming nothing was mandatory we weren't like doing archery like there were arts but there weren't like it wasn't a craft camp it basically was a be around in community camp hmm. and one of the hallmarks was learning how to hug well be around people and the the faculty of love in cultivating relationships and that's what you sort of spent your time doing for three weeks in the summer i would say that that was also how for me the uu cons the conferences that we had yeah. over weekends at different churches in florida were yeah just you could let the free flag fly and that's where i did a love feast for the first time mm, yes which we had all the the fruits and the treats and the finger foods laid out and and you couldn't feed yourself. What is what is that definition of heaven and hell? Where does that come from? Where hell is the place where your arms are too short. Well and the bamboo you... jackets. And there's different it comes from different traditions and there's an Indian version of it with uh, and a Chinese version of it with bamboo jackets. How is how does that one go? You're in a You're, essentially a straight jacket. Kind everyone's of? given uh, jackets made of bamboo and forks and a feast, and everyone's starving because they can't feed themselves until they realize they can, with their straight arms, they can feed each other. And so this is one way to proceed, is by living in service towards feeding physically and subtly each other mm -hmm. and being responsible for other people's hungers will allow you to be entrusted with someone feeding you. Mm. So that's, I don't know that it has one particular orientation. Well, interesting that geography. it comes from so many, that so many cultures and traditions would have a very similar story yeah. of the, the banquet table, it being about food. Yeah, well, feasting, of course, is you know, integral to any culture worth its salt. Yes. No pun intended. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Salt is a food thing. And we also prized hugging mm. <laughs> and long hugs and were very affectionate. Lots of massages and yes. cuddles. So did you go with your brother? Did your brother go to camp with no, you? No, my brother didn't go to the same camp until a few years later. I think my, my brother first went in 1988. He was too young. 
to go to the junior high camp and the timing didn't work out for whatever reason, I think, for him to go to the uh, young people's camp. So he went to junior high in 1988. By that point, I'd been to camp for two years. It had completely changed our relationship uh, and other relationships as well. How did you, when you came back, how did you comport yourself differently that shifted the relationship? Did you reach out to hug him? Did you? I don't know. I don't remember the particular moment, but you know, as that old spiritual goes, I ain't going to study war no more. I just, whatever barb was there between he and I, I was just willing to look past it or forgive it or forget it or push whatever it was and just embrace him and celebrate him. And mm. which I had it before in other ways, but I was sort of always quick to anger with him. And in my parents' eyes, which they always said was, they'd point to my brother and say, you're the instigator and antagonizer and you need, and they'd point at me. And they say, and you need to be less sensitive. Oh, how interesting. So Daniel was Moon and Scorpio, a little, can definitely like slip a knife in your ribs pretty fast and turn it. I don't think in, in the 10 years that we've been friends, I've ever seen you angry. I'm pretty slow to anger. Now, you're saying as a child, you were quick to anger with your brother. Yeah, right? but not anywhere else. Hmm. Not on, not on angered, but certainly my my father and my brother had fast tracks. <laughs> right. <laughs> my mom has the the your the, mom the has your panic button, track, right? Yes. The the hot button. Yeah. Yeah. There's that nice phrase of why do your parents push your buttons? Because they created them. Dun, dun, dun. Da. <laughs> Sad trombone sound. Womp, womp. Womp. <laughs> So there was a loving, you were able to to be softer and kinder with him and, and not allow him to, to instigate. And then there was another shift. Yeah. What, what happened there? I got married in August of 2002. And Daniel got married shortly thereafter to a woman who, when he was dating, had a lot of, they had a lot of issues, a lot of arguments together. Mm -hmm. And my brother and this woman fought a lot, but she really liked him and Daniel really liked her. Daniel, I think, is, of the two of us, squarer. The more square brother. Yes. And something that his wife at the time said after, I don't know, probably about 18 months or two years of marriage, something like that. She would say to him, and only found this out years later, she said, you're a fucked up person. You're fucked up because you're family. And if you ever want to become a normal person, you have to stop talking with them. Oh. And it was one less thing for them to fight about. So my brother sort of got on board and for years didn't talk to my parents or to me. But we lived in the same building. So my brother would when we'd pass each other in the hall, would literally growl at me and scowl. And it was never I was never given an explanation, but we still owned the house together, and I still had to interact with him to, like, you know, get the ladder or, you know, borrow the hammer or whatever. And there was just no explanation for it. It was really tense and difficult. And Susan, who I was married to at the time, it was a great strain on her. We didn't realize... Why, why we had our neighbors hating us. <sighs> and so we finally like asked, like, could we have a meeting about this? And we were told, if you don't understand why, then we, there's nothing to talk about. And it just sort of just kept on going on. So that's what happened. You, at some point, had a good enough relationship to buy this property together. Yeah, with my parents. Do you think there's some truth in what she thought? Do you think she's poisonous? Could you rephrase what you think you, what, what you're asking? Do you think she's blowing something out of proportion that is a little bit true, that he has issues stemming from his family? Sure. That's human. Um, of course. I, I wouldn't play armchair psychologist on this woman. She's not in a relationship with my brother anymore. 
It's been a long time. And, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. They've been divorced for six, seven years, six years, something like that. And how long after that did it take for him to start saying hello to you instead of scowling at you in the hallway? Mm, it took a while, but it changed slowly. And again, it's it's cordial. It's not really like friendly now, but it's cordial. We're moving towards cordial. On the highway to cordial. I'd say I actually wouldn't say on the highway. I'd say it's on the back road to cordial. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. I think I've asked you this, but I don't think I got an answer. How did your parents express their love for you? Oh, in lots of ways. I mean, my parents were really supportive of me intellectually. They, I was a smart kid, and so they... They praised me in that regard for knowing stuff. They praised me for being kind and doing good things for people. So they were physically affectionate, but not overly so. I mean, they supported me in incredible ways. So their love was actualized by sending me to good schools and giving me incredible experiences, like going to camp. I mean, I remember in my sophomore year of high school, I was on the starting wrestling team and... I was wrestling, I think our meet was something like at four o'clock in the afternoon and deep in the belly of Queens. And my father showed up at the match, which meant, which, I mean, it was that it was at a time when my father like worked in New Jersey at the point at that time and must have like, it was a big thing for him to come. And so that was incredible to get a ride home and to see him in the stands. And mm. uh, that was great. What? Sure. How did you learn about sex growing up? A couple ways. I certainly was curious when I was a kid and definitely did the sort of like, you know, I'll show you mine if you can, if I can see yours sort of thing with young peers. I mean, very, very young, you know, three, four, five. I was raised in a spiritual organization here in New York called the School of Practical Philosophy, which is associated with a school in England called the School of Economic Science, which is associated with the Advaita Vedanta mystic strain of non-dualism. Mm. And so I was raised in this very profoundly spiritual organization. I was meditating from a young age, doing spiritual work, you know, cleaning for the sake of spiritual activity. So everything had this deep, reflective, philosophical, spiritual cast everything from schoolwork to sleep to food mm. it was all there so i remember from a very young age and there was no sort of specific shaming of it but one of these sort of exchanges of i'll show you mine you show me yours what we were caught and i had a forced conversation with the head of the philosophy school at the time a woman by the name of joy dillingham who's an incredible woman who i have mm. tremendous respect for and admiration for it was definitely like you knew you were getting a talking to and i was like five and i was <laughs> told like this sort of exchange of energy wasn't appropriate because it was i don't remember the exact words i was five but it, i would simplify it now to say it isn't a good use of your spiritual energy to cultivate this particular practice huh. of doing that and i'd say that was the the general language that I got when I was a kid was, yes, you're interested in sex and all that's good, but, you know, it's important to practice brahmachari and to have absent... Celibacy. Oh, well, that's one... Or restraint. 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 Because this has... When this energy runs ungoverned in a body, in a physical or a subtle body, it has effect on the chitta, on the heart, on the state of the world, on your energy, on your capacity to meditate, all this other stuff. And so it wasn't like you shouldn't have it. It just was like control it. Beware. It's Beware. a dangerous thing to allow it to run rampant. Yeah. It, it, it has spiritual consequences for you, other people, and the world. That's heavy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it doesn't. It never said like you'll ruin the world, but there was a sense that like you're – your heart could be scarred. Uh, you could scar other people's hearts. Yeah, so that that was in the mix, to be sure. But I also learned 
about, I went to an all boys school from first grade to eighth grade. So there weren't a lot of girls around. So I also learned about sex through passing of, you know, dirty magazines and watching Robin Bird late at night. And, uh, the, what the, was that? In New York in the eighties, there was a, uh, a television show called the Robin Bird show, which was on Friday nights or 1130 or, or something, or maybe it was one o'clock and it was an hour long and she was a f- porn star in the seventies and she interviewed other porn stars to talk about sex and they'd sort of like shake their barely their bathing suit tit- covered tits or, <laughs> and just talk about whatever. Um, it was very titillating. No pun intended. You always intend your puns. I actually Don't. Did, I didn't. <laughs> um, dad humor. Dad humor. So I learned about that. But that, that was one strand. But I also had this deeply spiritual aspect. And my dad, when I was very young, worked in the premier spiritual bookstore in the world um, called Weiser's, which I was sort of the mascot of when I was a kid. <laughs> and even though I didn't stop working there when I was seven, we still went to the bookstore all the time and I still was sort of hanging out there and my father had his own sort of spiritual library at home. Did you I, have glasses then? No. I pictured you like a little Harry Potter. Okay, go on. No, not at so all. So your dad had his own I definitely was raised in the stacks though and, and there were huge gigantic stacks which I used to climb in like a jungle gym and sit on shelves and read books. <laughs> and your dad had a huge spiritual library at home. At home, yes, he did. But... I knew from when I was a kid at Weiser's that there was like a section there, which I just would see when I was six and seven and eight on the intersection of sex and spirit on Tantra or any number of things. I remember seeing those books and thinking they looked interesting. And so in my teens, as I was learning about sex, I'd go to Weiser's and I'd read books because I knew the old guys who worked there from when I was a kid. And I'd go there and I'd read books on tantra or taoism and sex and sort of take whatever i could read from the books and and i already had my own meditation practice when i was that age my own spiritual stuff that i was doing and i just sort of supplement and learn and add stuff in and practice myself so that's how i was learning those two fibers were being braided together there probably was a subtle third someplace else but I couldn't say what that is at the moment. I mean, I probably learned some from Roe, to be sure, about learning about consent and learning about how nudity doesn't equal sex. And that's the only place I really was sort of around girls was at camp when I was 13, 14, and then got to high school, and that was sort of a different bag. So I wish that more boys had some similar mm, learnings mm. about sex early on. And I experience you as someone who has such implicit respect for for human life, but but specifically also for women. Thank you. And I was talking with someone the other day and wondering, you know, how how do we teach our boys to be the kind of men that love and cherish women? Mm. Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah. This culture is sort of a heartbreak. So much. Because every force is really running counter to that happening. And we're just talking about boys. I mean, the the same is true for girls. Yes. It was the best thing that I could say. Because there's, you know, particular, you'd say, oh, you know, read these books or like the most broad thing I could say that might actually be implementable is to start to cultivate village mindedness Mm. because my idea of what the appropriate thing you might want to have boys learn might not be yours although between the two of us they might be fairly similar but whoever's listening i mean access to emotion and access to play and cooperativeness cooperativeness and uh less intellectualism, all sorts of things could be great benefit to be sure. Uh, But I think cultivating village mindedness where it's not just two parents who are responsible for this, but any relationship that's worth having is worth having a number of people 
buying into its livelihood. And so it doesn't just take a village to raise a child. It takes a village to, to raise a relationship that will have the child even emerge and to support it and to sustain it. And so for, and not that this is some sort of magic that if there's a village that all of a sudden it's like that, but to have a whole raft of men and women of different ages who are responsible for kids who aren't, and not just the parents who somehow need to imbue all their super wise progressive thoughts and the grooviest books and the most liberated conversations that never watch television and always hug their kids and <laughs> teach them consent. It sounds great. It sounds great. <laughs> I mean, you can do all those things, it but, really does. <laughs> um, and you, and de-gender your, like whatever your books, like I, whatever, like that stuff, maybe that's important, but to learn these small lessons from dozens of people, <sighs> that's probably more valuable. At least that's my sense and my scent that I'm following. There's that piece of cherishing elders too. When I see women being treated badly, I don't see those folks treating elderly people well either. Absolutely. Our capacity to have elders. I and mean, we have lots of elders, to be sure, who take drugs. But we have very few elders who give medicine. Hmm. I don't have any elders in my life. None. My parents, but they're my parents. It doesn't feel like a mentor or a, a person I turn to for their wisdom called from their time on this earth. I'm very fortunate that I have a few and they are at different orbits, different levels of closeness. I feel incredibly blessed. I mean, just, there's a woman named Diane Palmerson who lives in Comox, British Columbia, 80 years old. And I, I will brag about knowing this woman. She's mm. an, I live in the shade of her snow capped head. <laughs> I'm, I mean, my eyes are tearing up just even thinking about this woman, how good she is to me and how I can't even, I'm so delighted that she's taken a shine to me mm. and loves me. How did you meet her? An orphan wisdom school. Tell me about orphan wisdom school. <laughs> oh, orphan wisdom school. Orphan wisdom school is a, it's a teaching house, a school that was established by Stephen Jenkinson, a man of, from Canada, from Scarborough, Ontario, but now lives two hours northish of Ottawa on a farm. And the Orphan Wisdom School is a school that wonders aloud about how our culture became so unskilled in pursuing its relationship to death and grief and seeks to understand and wonder about how that came to be and how we might cultivate those skills so we might be able to love life more deeply. When you took me to that weekend with Stephen at Roe. Yeah. I took notes, but I never reread them. And really, you're such a good note taker. Yeah, I read it in the moment because it feels then it is more indelible to my soul. And you I have often, such nice handwriting I often too. don't reread them. Oh wow! I like your handwriting. Mm. Thank you. And I don't even know if I took notes on this, but what I remember the most is him saying, I'm completely paraphrasing, people, you know, roll out of bed cursing in the morning, the fact that they're alive. And I did that, exactly that. I didn't like waking up, really ever, but, <laughs> but especially with an alarm. And I would wake up never feeling rested, which is still true, but I would wake up saying, fuck. <laughs> And oh, I would, you know, with one eye closed, stumble to the bathroom and my roommate would say hello. And I would say. <laughs> and speaking about grief and dying in a room with people who had likely experienced much more of it than me, 
thus far in my life. I was so impressed by the preciousness of my own life mm. and recognized how that was not my re-entry. That was not how I wanted to re-enter the world every day from a dream state. And I came home from Roe and dropped me off. And the next day when I woke up, I thought, Phew. And then I went, mm, mm And I pumped my arms over my head and I went, alive, thank you. And I do some variation of that every morning. I've done it every morning since. And sometimes I list gratitude. Sometimes I think of things that I'm grateful for. Sometimes I just feel my body and go, mm. But I usually pump my fists over my head. And Lovely. celebrate that I am re-entering. It's no small thing to wake the up. world. No, and surely one day I won't. So every day that I do, thank you, and thank you for taking me to see him. Oh, you're welcome. You've been a dear friend for a long time, mm -hmm. and it was a, a blessing to be able to take you and to give that to you. It's a beautiful gift. Another one of those times when I say, yes, Matthew Stillman has changed my life multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> and that was one of them. Tell me the story of how you met Susan again. On uh, December the 31st, 2001, actually December 30th, 2001, I was at a meditation retreat in Water Perry outside of London on a philosophy retreat. This was maybe the second day of the retreat, maybe the third, and I was going over New Year's. And the meals at these events were usually fairly simple. Maybe there were something like 110 people from around the world to study and meditate together, all sort of the same age. On the the night of the 30th, I sat next to a woman who was working on, in the kitchen staff, and we were just chatting, and she mentioned that they were totally stressed because they were, had just been given the instruction before dinner to have a fancy multi-course meal for New Year's the next day. Mm. And they couldn't get any other food than what they already had. And this really was fairly simple food, like salad, cheese, potatoes. Like, there wasn't a lot of fruit. And I said to her, like, oh, that's not a problem. I can, I have experience with this. I could really take care of this with the team pretty easily. She said, you've got the job. So on the night of the 30th, right after dinner, I was sort of introduced to everyone who would be involved. And we said, we'll see you all the next morning. So on the morning of the 31st, at 5.30 in the morning, we started working together. Susan was in charge of the kitchen, and we took a break at 7.30 or 8 to meditate. And then we took our first long break at 10. And at, at 10 a.m., I knew I was going to marry Susan. And we weren't chatting much. We were talking about turnips and soup. <laughs> and this was in a big Georgian mansion. So... It was clattery stone kitchens, it was loud. But wherever we were working, I could always hear Susan. I had this great abiding sense of partnership with her, with this deep sense of wanting to serve her. And then I also had a recollection of a memory, which I had thought I had thought of before in my life, but it came then. And the thought that the memory that I had was of me when I used to live on Ninth Street when I was about two and I was playing with trains. And the thought that I had then was, oh, one day I'm going to be married and whoever that person is, I love them now. <laughs> and then I went back to playing with my trains. <laughs> and so at 10 o'clock in the morning, I just sort of woke up to the fact that I loved Susan and that I always had. And there was no falling. 
and it was and is the clearest thing I've ever known. And in the best way, my life got completely disassembled because of that. And so within um, 36 hours, we uh, were talking and I was like, I guess we're going to get married. <laughs> Let's point in that direction. And we did. We were married for 13 years. I was very lucky to be married to her. And that's how we met. Whoever that person is, I love them now. Yeah. <laughs> My heart is still opening from the experience of meeting and loving Susan. How have you kept it open? I've heard it tell that someone once made the, uh, the prayer. My heart is broken. May it never heal. For it is open. And perhaps I might have stumbled in the back door of that prayer. Because I may have been, have been broken hearted for lots of reasons in my life. But probably bypassed that break through my intense spiritual practices and devotions and attempts to transcend my marriage with Susan ended. I described it as that my house then became situated on Grief Bay mm. and the, the winds just blow there and sometimes hard and sometimes soft and sometimes the tides run high or sometimes low but it was always present and my heart has been broken open by the ending of that form of the relationship, a deep sadness for both of us in different ways. I, I want to feel that. I want to feel that whoever that person is, I love them now. Because in some ways, it, and I don't really believe this, but in some ways it sort of feels like love that hasn't happened yet, then maybe it won't. It's one powerful way to love someone, for sure. But I don't know that it's the only way. Love how you were too. I was going to say before then, did you know that you wanted to be married? <laughs> no, maybe I was two and a half, so maybe at two I started to... No, it just was something I just sort of... Thought like, oh, it just popped in. What do you love about marriage? only had one so I wouldn't deign to say that what I love about my marriage is what anyone else should or could I know I'm just asking about you I know I'm just saying that part there are many things to say that sweeten my days in that blessed relationship and I could go on but I'd say one small thing which isn't small at all was starting to have my soul get bent in the shape of not living just for myself, but even more profoundly, maybe beginning to believe in my worthiness. That Susan would leave where she was from and love me as she did and does, but in a different way now. I sometimes had the sense like maybe I'm actually worth that. So uh, in the sweetest way, I always sort of had the the cloud floating around me like maybe you're worth it. Maybe you're actually pretty good. <laughs> Your parents believe in you and you're sort of like just almost expected. And of course, there's heartbreaks with that when they don't. But yeah, 
I remember when I was traveling and I I came to stay with you for a little bit and I said how I I really wanted to feel whole. Mm. And you said, I see you that way. I see you as whole. Yeah. And I feel whole now. And now I'd really like to feel worthy. Yeah. It's a great service if we might proceed as if we're needed, despite any any clear um, justification that that's true. I love it when he says that. Yeah. Proceed as if you are needed. Does he also say proceed as if you are necessary? I think Dr. J has said that too. But it also adds that this is a village-minded proposition as well, that believing in yourself is actually too big a a prospect for just you, and it's properly spread out on being believed in by other people, by elders, by friends. We all have terrible myopic visions of who we are. We just can't see it. So we need other people to believe in us and to show it. Or we need to do it for other people, too, because they can't do it for themselves. Yes. So Susan was the... Um, and I, of course, have had plenty of people who have loved me and treated me well and said kind things to me and said I made a difference. But, oh, Susan... All the orientation changed. It's beautiful to hear it for me because I had a story. I had a story that you were underappreciated in your marriage. Well, Susan loved me. I mean, it doesn't mean that she didn't have her own hitches on the way she may have expressed that sometimes, but God, did she love me. Mm. I loved her. I love her. Mm. Susan will always be my great first love. I'm graced to have had such an experience. I think that's why when you want to take the beautiful measure of someone, you ask their friends. Yeah. Let me give credit where credit is due. This episode was edited by Chad Michael Snavely. Listen to the rest of the podcast in his catalog through chadmichael.com. My sumptuous cover art is by the illustrator Shauna Shea, whom you can hire through 99designs. The theme music is by Alan Markley on Instagram as Plastic Cannons. In order to hire out Matthew's brain for a few hours to help you creatively approach your challenges, find him on stillmansays.com. Every week I'm reading one of my thoughtful, well-worded five-star reviews in gratitude to the folks that wrote them. This one, titled Horizontal with Lila Goes There, is from Kipples and Bits. It reads, Stimulates your secret spots, satisfies your cravings. Shocking, raw, honest, educational, and most definitely fun. A sometimes gentle, sometimes rough way to stretch yourself. Take it all in and take it deep. Kipples and Bits, I got a little hot under the collar reading that aloud. Thank you for lying down with me. And thank you all for lying down with us. May you have someone to love, something to do, and something to look forward to. Thanks, man. Thanks, Lila. I love you. I love you too. I've been lucky to love you for a long time. <laughs>